Britain's highest honor. The Empire State Building glows Rutgers Red, a salute to the 8-0 Scarlet Knights, whose kingdom sits 40 miles to the west. It's the birthplace of college football, traced to a backyard battle with Princeton in 1869, won by Rutgers 6-4. But this campus is in a football frenzy never witnessed at Rutgers. Students snagging up 10,000 tickets in four hours Tuesday, bracing for the biggest moment ever. Now Louisville's already tasted triumph, a signature win against West Virginia, but the celebrations died down now. Back to business, another battle of unbeatens in prime time. And welcome to College Football Primetime, presented by Applebee's Rutgers Stadium in Piscataway, New Jersey, racing for its biggest game ever. They could have sold out a stadium twice this size, 8-0 Louisville and 8-0 Rutgers. It's a battle for Big East supremacy, but still a long way to go in this conference, not even halfway through their conference schedule. Rutgers still has a game at West Virginia. Louisville playing for higher sakes. They're up to number three in the BCS, and they're on track for that national championship game. Greetings, I'm Chris Fowler. Should be a fun night here on the campus of Rutgers. Let's face it, this is pro sports country. About to pile up to New York. The Jets and Giants play just down the turnpike in New Jersey. But there is a long history of impact college games in the Metro New York area. It's just that it's been dormant for about 60 years. It was Yankee Stadium, the scene. Number one Army, number one Notre Dame. Back in 1946, these were great teams, hard fought game, a scoreless tie with huge implications as General Eisenhower looked on. So, since that game, there hadn't been a lot to talk about in terms of national title impact college games in Metro New York. The U.S. population has more than doubled since then. Gas prices have gone up, thankfully so has the annual salary. So, Mr. Herb Street from Army Notre Dame Yankee Stadium to over here in New Jersey. Rutgers, the place is rocking. They're ready. This is their moment in the sun. But here comes Louisville off a huge win a week ago with a very business-like approach tonight. Well, of course, the big win that they had last week, they moved up from 5-3 to three in the BCS standings, so there is a lot of pressure. And there is a question of whether or not they'll have a hangover emotionally coming back. My opinion, being on the field watching this team in warm-ups, Chris, they are dialed in and ready. I don't think there'll be any hangover at all. If you look at the rest of their schedule, the concern that I would have for, West, for, for Louisville, if they survive tonight, I think the potential hangover is not tonight and not November 18th when they play South Florida, who beat them last year, but November 25th at Pitt. That's where I think they have to be careful emotionally, but they are ready, they're focused and fired up, and I think they have a lot of respect for Rutgers. Well, I think they have a lot of respect from the pollsters and momentum, but style points do count in all those games. Louisville must win impressively. They clobbered Rutgers very impressively impressively a year ago 56 to 5 at their place dominated in the second half but Rutgers says we're a whole new defense from a year ago and this time it's in our place one word sums up the difference and that's confidence Rutgers comes into this game with a belief that they can play now with a team like Louisville and I think the big reason of course it starts with their head coach and what he brings to the table the confidence that he instills in his team the success that they have tasted late last year going to a bowl game the offseason conditioning all the the effort and everything that they did, the effort that they put into this year, they're 8-0, they're confident, but they need this atmosphere in this stadium to be the difference and the equalizer to keep them in the ballgame. He coordinates the defense. Bobby Petrino calls the plays for Louisville. It should be a good collision of head coaches who play a big role in their teams. Motivation, an important role for Shiano tonight. He's with Aaron Andrews. Well, Coach, when you came here six years ago, you said this is the environment and the situation you envision. Now that it's here, what do you think? Oh, it's great. These kids are great. Our fans, uh, state of New Jersey, New York City, everybody's excited. we got to go out and play now, and our kids will do that. We'll give everything we have. And those kids bought into that vision that you were selling. What are you going to tell them about embracing it before they head out onto the field? I already have. Just what you said, you know. You work all this time to be able to come out and enjoy a game like tonight. Let it fly. Go play. Thank you so much. Thank you. You know, Rutgers has never been involved in a game Hitting ranked against ranked. It's incredible. It's a very, very tough ticket here. Rutgers fans of all types ready for this ball game. Forget about it. You can't tune out. We're coming up from Jersey shortly. Back to the studio. Rutgers 
All right, Chris, the alma mater of Queen Latifah and David Stern getting set to play a huge game. What, you're surprised by the dichotomy, the diversity of the Rutgers alums? Absolutely, you dropped the Queen Latifah. <laughs> <laughs> Alongside Lou Holtz, Mark May, I'm Reese Davis. 137 years ago, the Scarlet Knights played their first college football game. It was the first college football game, 6-4 victory over Princeton. Since then, up until this point, this is the biggest game, Lou, in the history of the school. You've had a lot of experience in, in program-defining moments. How do you get your team ready for this one? Well, we had a situation very similar to this in 1988. Miami had beaten Notre Dame by over 50 points, just as Louisville beat Rutgers last year by 50 points. The main thing was confidence, but it's not talking about confidence. It's just the way you conduct yourself. And you have to convince your players that they can win. And what was really critical was in that game, at the end of the first quarter, Miami always thought they'd win, but so did our players. They would wink at Miami, confident like, hey, we're going to be here today, tomorrow, and next week. And when they're changing the ends of the field, at the end of the first quarter, the offensive tackle of Miami said to Frank Stams, our defensive end, he said, this game's going to go down the wire, isn't it? Why did he feel that way? Because our players were confident that we were going to win. We convinced them we could win. And by the same token, Miami players thought they could win. We eventually won the game 31-30 and what had been determined the greatest game in Notre Dame history. Now, this is a big defining moment for Rutgers. Mark, uh, how do you see the Scarlet Knights mindset coming into this? Well, I think you can go into a game like this, and I played in big games, you can never have a doubt and you have to be very resilient as a player no matter what happens under any circumstances if you turn the ball over if you throw an interception if you miss a tackle if you miss a block throw caution to the wind and forget about it and move on to the next play that's the way you have to approach this game Louisville's done that in the past they've proven they can do that against West Virginia last week and against Miami earlier this season in a big game atmosphere it's just up to Rutgers right now can they do it and I think the key is quarterback Mike Teal has to have one heck of a ball game his best of his career because you look at his career he started 11 games at Rutgers eight touchdowns 18 interceptions in a big game atmosphere can he come through and carry this team if they get behind by a touchdown or two they don't become just a running football team they have to throw the football and you just saw Ray Rice loosening up doing some calisthenics Louisville would love to take him away and try to make Mike Teal beat them many believe that he doesn't have the capability of doing that now let's say, Lou, that Louisville does indeed run the table. It's been the question on the tips of the tongue in college football the last couple of weeks. Louisville finishes undefeated should they play in the BCS championship game. I can't say that right now. What would have happened had the University of Texas not played Ohio State but played some directional school from Michigan, whether it be Northern, Eastern, they would have been undefeated. Yes, Louisville, I do not believe, is going to be the second best team in the country. What happens if Florida beats the University of Auburn in the championship game and runs the table? There are a lot of different things. Are they deserving? Yes, but so are some other teams. What if? What if? I don't deal in what, what if. if. I, I deal in you. what's going on today. <laughs> Louisville is undefeated. At season's end, if they are undefeated, they will most likely play against nine, that's correct, nine bowl opponents this season. Now, if you look at their body of work throughout the season, they've got one of the best offenses. They're balanced, running the football over 200 yards a game. Brian Brown is back healthy at quarterback, passing for 289 yards a game. They're a tough team to face. There's only one team out there. Possibly, if they run the table, that should be number two. I'm not going to tell you who it is yet, though. I, I know who it is. I know. Is who there it. any question who it is? And they aren't going to run the table. He said if they run the table. I said if they Oregon, beat California. Cal, Notre if they Dame, don't play no Let me tell you, I want to show you what, this, what the nation US. thinks right now. Uh, it's sort of like an over. We've seen some overwhelming elections in the last few days in this country, haven't we? Sports Nation poll. 46 of the states, the ones in red, believe that Louisville's going to win the game. The two states going for Rutgers, New Jersey, and West Virginia. West Virginia? Although there are a couple uh, undecided. And I was born in West Virginia. So that means you voted for Rutgers? Pulling yes. the upset there? Yes. <laughs> Let's go back to Chris, getting ready for this big one, Chris. That's red versus red here tonight. Rutgers Stadium, 2,000 extra bleachers brought into the end zone. Capacity 43-5, and it could have been double that tonight. In walks a very veteran Louisville team, Kirk, led by Brian Brown. Well, Brian Brown, I've been told, had his best week of practice. They told us that last week, and he lit up the scoreboard. So expect a big night from him because he's physically capable. Mario Urudia, his go-to receiver, has a size advantage over Rutgers defensive backs. 
And I think Okoye, we saw last week as a defensive lineman, he can disrupt a lot of things. And as much as Rutgers wants to run the football, Okoye will be a very, very big key to that Louisville front four. Still, that Louisville defense did give up more than 500 yards to that West Virginia offense, which is very speedy. Rutgers will come at him with a, a different kind of running attack, a very muscular attack led by Ray Rice. Well, Ray Rice, the two, two uh, young men in the middle, Ray Rice and Brian Leonard, their go-to guys in the backfield. They, of course, allow this offense to be able to be effective running the football. Go to the, your far left. Mike Teal has to play well tonight. Rutgers, because they rely so much on running the ball, cannot get behind early. Teal, for Rutgers to win, will have to make some plays throwing the football. And the other side, number 36, Courtney Green. He'll be very, very active. True sophomore, leads the team in tackles. Have to come up and try to slow down Colby Smith and try to get Brian Brown an obvious passing downs. Rutgers has 30 sacks. He'll try to make life tough on Brian Brown, but beware the play calling ability of Bobby Petrino. He's with Aaron. Well, Coach, such an emotional win for you guys last Thursday night versus West Virginia. Now it's role reversal time. You're coming into the Lions Den. What have you done to guard your kids about entering tonight with an emotional hangover? Well, we had to put the West Virginia game right behind us on Saturday. We had a great week of practice, great week of preparation. What a beautiful night for a big-time football game. And speaking of preparation, numerically, this is the best defense you've faced all season long. What challenge do they present to you tonight? Oh, they're very good. They rush the passer. They're very fast. They tackle well so we got to get after him early get some points on the board early in the game coach thank you thanks a lot the crowd here all dressed in red on its feet waving white towels they've been counting down to kickoff since the beginning of the season less than six minutes away and let's hear from the oldest living rutgers alum who won't be here in person tonight but he'll be watching on tv <laughs> a huge scarlet knights fan 810 Thanks a real and time, my boys. But all right, there's ever more shall stand. For oh, has he not stood since the time of the flood on the banks of the old Ertan? Yay! That's great. That's <laughs> good. Thank you. Thank you. ESPN's College Football Primetime, brought to you by Guinness Draft Stout. Drink responsibly. Brilliant. Garmin, we'll take you there. And TD Ameritrade, the independent spirit. Enjoying Guinness Draft in a... Last week on Thursday night. Seized its moment, survived Big East epic number one. Clayton escapes to the backfield, but chased down and lost it again. Picked up by Jackson. Malik Jackson runs in. Touchdown. Trent Guy races to the 30. Great clean at the 10 5. Touchdown, Trent Guy. Brom takes the snap, goes to the fade pattern of the end zone to Yerudia. Touchdown, Yerudia. The Louisville Cardinals have knocked off West Virginia. Still unconquered, the Cardinals have staked a claim and charted a course to the BCS championship game. Tonight, episode two, perfection in Piscataway, where Louisville collides with fellow unbeaten Rutgers. Yes, undefeated Rutgers. The Scarlet Knights have blended a fast and fierce defense that no one saw yet. And a stout rushing offense led by Ray Rice. Two of the country's last five perfect teams go toe-to-toe -to -toe in the battle for the Big East. Cardinals versus Scarlet Knights now. Get us good seats? Yeah, real close. Yeah, I want to see everything. I want to be part of the action. The excitement. We're close, right? Close. Real close. James Gandolfini, Rutgers, class of 83. He's been involved in helping sell season tickets. There's no trouble selling tickets tonight. Extra bleachers brought in and a frenzy, the biggest on-campus Rutgers game in at least 137 years since they took on Princeton in that very first college football game. Rutgers, 8-0. Louisville, well, they were the hosts in a game very much like this a week ago. They took care of business, knocking off West Virginia. They climbed to number three in the BCS, and all eyes around the country who are a fan of 
the SEC, the Big Ten, the Pac-10, Texas perhaps wanting to see how Louisville will respond here on the road against an undefeated Rutgers team. Well, if you're a fan of college football, you're a fan of this game because this game has BCS implications. And whether you're a Louisville fan and you're at home saying, let's go Cardinals, or Chris, as you said, you're a fan of one of the other one-loss teams, you are watching and very interested to see the result of this game, as you said, round two in this Big East clash after last week's game with West Virginia. Greg Shiano's Rutgers players have never been in a game like this. Louisville's had their collisions that have meant something before these players, of course, lived with the hype and conquered it against West Virginia last week. Rutgers ranked at number 15 in the AP. Never been ranked higher than that. Never played in a game involving two ranked teams. Think about that. That's why there's this atmosphere here tonight. Are they up to it? This defense that's allowed no one to score more than 20 points in any game. Great at pressuring the quarterback, but they haven't faced an offense even close to as good as Louisville's. Well, I think the, the thing that I really noticed last week, seeing a healthy Brian Brom, is that Louisville's offense can get on the field with any defense in the country and have a chance to execute. And it's going to be a challenge for the Scarlet Knights. I know that's their strength. They play great defense. They're going to have to feel the energy from this crowd to have a chance to slow down the balance from Louisville's attack. They, they go well over 200 yards rushing and passing, and that balance is tough to stop. Does it surprise you that uh, Rutgers won the toss and wants the football right away? No deferring to the second half. They say, give us the football. Perhaps a chance to chew clock right away. They've been a very good first quarter team and more importantly, keep Brian Brown well, off the field. I think it plays right into the hands of Greg Schiano and what he wants to do as a head coach. He's, he's talked about a vision and Aaron Andrews talked to him about it before the game. I think they're welcoming that by saying, we'll take the ball. We're not going to hide. We're not going to be afraid of Bobby Petrino and the fact that they obviously want the ball first. We'll take the ball and we'll throw our team out there to see what we can do with Mike Teal, who I think, again, is going to have to have a big night throwing the ball. Needs to get off to a very good start. The young quarterback, I think, to give Rutgers a chance in this game. Well, they need help from that offensive line, which has played so well. And Ray Rice, who averages more carries than any running back in the country. Is Rutgers up to it? Their crowd certainly is. Todd Flannery to boot it away for the undefeated Cardinals. It's Willie Foster and James Townsend deep for the undefeated Scarlet Knights. What a scene. Very short kick. It's taken at the 12-yard line. Rutgers looks like they have a fake reverse on. And cutting inside is Townsend. Louisville's coverage seem not really fooled. And the Knights will start at the 20-yard line. It's a Rutgers team built around the running game. And the guys up front are very, very important. Pedro Sosa and Zuda, NFL-bound tackles. The coaches here believe the guards have been a pleasant surprise. This offensive line will be tested tonight, but it's, it's the strength of this team. You know, a lot of teams have tried to stop Rutgers and Ray Rice by putting eight or nine guys at the line of scrimmage. I think Louisville will do that tonight. Puts a lot more pressure on the offensive line. Although here they're coming out in a four-five receiver set on the first play. It's the senior Brian Leonard to the right of Teal. And they motion Clark Harris, the tight end, back in a split formation. And Teal's going to throw long in the first play. Had a man overthrew him. He was looking for Kenny Britt, the talented true freshman who had a step on William Gay just overthrown. I love the call by Greg Schiano and his offensive coordinator, Craig Versteeg. Not only do they take the ball, which is surprising, they're going to go at one, one back, four receivers, and they're going to challenge the best corner on Louisville's team, William Gay. And he had his man open. It was just a matter of trying to convert. But great call there to challenge this Louisville defense. What's the call now on second and ten? It's Leonard, the setback. And the senior gets it. Cuts back. Has a crease. Fights forward and has a first down. This is Brian Leonard who's taken a back seat this year as Rice has gotten the lion's share of the offensive duties. But he's become a much better blocker, very good receiver. They will challenge a Louisville defense that makes some changes up front. You've got Cox and Grady to look for a more physical defensive line than what they typically start. And the defense, uh, you know, we just talked about up front. Okoye will have to have a big game, 91. He played so well last week against West Virginia's offensive line. And right there, 
Rutgers hit a crease. And now it's the first carry for Rice. Running left. Has a gap and is slammed to the turf by Preston Smith and Latarius Thomas, but a nice gain for Rice. Rice is the sophomore out of New Rochelle, New York. That's suburban New York City. A couple of tight ends, and you get a really good indication of how many white jerseys are up at the line of scrimmage. You're talking about eight or nine guys up inside the box, and yet still Ray Rice is able to find the crease there and pick up six yards on first and ten. First down yardage crucial for Rutgers. Rice motioning at the top of the formation. He's a wide receiver. Ruville pays attention to him. Finally, they go inside the brick. The freshman, a flag flies as he gets first down yardage across the 40. This is the big recruit, the 6'4", 205 pound receiver out of Bayonne, New Jersey. Face mask, number 27 on the defense, five yard penalty for the end of the play, first down. Gavin Smart guilty of the penalty. Britt only has two catches coming into this game, Kirk, but they seem intent on involving him. Yeah, I, I really am impressed right now with, with the way, that it's very early in the game, the way they've decided to attack with Mike Teal. Mike Teal is a question mark on this offense, but they have decided to, instead of hiding from that and waiting till third down, put the ball into his head, put the ball into his hands early in the game and give him a chance to be successful on easier passing downs. It's Britt in motion. Teal, hands to Rice. Rice bouncing straight ahead at 5'9", 195. You see the straight ahead strength of Rice. Brandon Sharp is safety on the stop. And the thing about Mike Teal that I've noticed in studying him and getting ready for this game, is, and there it is. When you're 23-0 at Don Bosco Prep, one of the better high school programs, not only in the East Coast, but throughout the country, tells you a lot about his attitude. Back-to-back -back state titles in New Jersey, great high school football in New Jersey. Overall, now 33-1 as a starting quarterback here at Rutgers and going back and looking at his high school days. The only loss to Louisville last year. So he is a winner. Tonight, they're giving him a chance. He's improved his decision-making a lot because he's had a lot of interception problems in his career. Here he flips it over the middle, incomplete. Coaches love Teal. I mean, they say he is a winner. He knows how to perform under pressure, but he's a little bit uh, eager sometimes to sort of make, you know, fit the ball in there, make a decision. And last year, as a, as a freshman, had a lot of interception problems. Right. This year, he's cleaned it up a bit. He threw 10 interceptions last year, just over, over 100 attempts. You're talking about 10% of your throws that are intercepted. A lot of that is just youth and inexperience, maybe trying to force some things, predetermine where you might go with the football. But it, this will have to be his best game of his career for them to be able to move the ball against Louisville. His first pressure situation on third down. Third and seven. Pressure up the middle. He was hit as he threw the ball and batted away incomplete. So Louisville brought the blitz. Teal stood in there, but took a shot as he let the ball go. Well, Louisville is a zone blitz team. They like to bring pressure. That time, Nate Harris came right up the middle. And I think there was enough confusion on the offensive line they were able to get to Teal before he was ready to throw. He had an open man downfield. Part of Rutgers component, to a good punter, Joe Radigan, the senior, second in the nation, 46 yards a punt. And back deep is Trent Guy, who took one to the house against the Mountaineers a week ago in a short punt. Radigan unloads a high, deep kick that Guy will let bounce, and it's going to head into the end zone. Touchback. 50 yards on the punt. So Rutgers, an impressive start to the drive. It stalls, and Louisville's first possession will start at its 20. When we come back, Brian Brown will go on offense. Rutgers and Louisville scoreless. For the independent and... And welcome back. Across the river. Across the river in Times Square. A salute to college football. I'm telling you, Rutgers has carved out space in the sports pages here, on the airwaves, the talk radio. Yeah, it's still a pro sports town, but they have really embraced Rutgers football here. That's not an everyday thing in no. New York City, as you know. Yeah, the Empire State Building. I mean, the city is embracing the Scarlet Knights. It's exciting to see the East Coast embrace college football. Colby Smith, the setback in the eye formation. Louisville's first play of the night. It's a play action fake, and Brown wants to fire deep over the middle. Has a man open, and Douglas collects it inside the Rutgers 35. Ball pops loose. They're saying down, no fumble. 
No fumble. It's a catch and a completion of 45 yards on Louisville's first play to silence this big crowd. So successful in first down throws last week, Kirk. Well, that is one way to silence a crowd, and you have three receivers. Douglas works to the middle, and it's tough for Rencart, the linebacker, with two, two safeties in the middle of the field, Chris. It's up to the linebacker to try to stay with a third receiver, and Douglas just too much speed for him. He outran him, and a great throw by Braun. And clear that the ground caused that fumble. On second down, Braun throwing again over the middle, incomplete, a flag is down. Prior to the snap, false start, number 68 on the offense, five yard penalty, and he's first down. And you got George Bussey, the tackle. We talked about the confidence of this Rutgers defense, and they certainly need, need a boost here. The Louisville offense, it was Arudia and Douglas, each with six catches last week. Barnage, the tight end, got shut out by West Virginia, first time in a long time. And Arudia and Douglas going over 100 yards receiving each against West Virginia. So it's a team that uh, gets the ball downfield in a hurry, as they did on that first play. First and 15 after the penalty. It's Colby Smith. He's strung out and smacked to the ground. And Terrell Flyers to the linebacker for Rutgers. They're on the stop. The Scarlet Knight defense, number two in yards allowed, number two in points allowed. Very quick, undersized. You know, Foster only 260. Meekins only 275, but they're very active. Very active, and if you, as a fan at home, I want you to watch Rutgers' defensive line and how much twisting and stunning they do on almost every play. They barely got set before the ball was snapped. Brock Bowl and the fullback was dropped for a loss. One of the reasons they have to move as much as they do, Greg Schiano knowing that he doesn't have a lot of size up front with his defensive line, and going up tonight against Louisville, he's giving up not only size as far as the height, but look at the difference in the weight. And that's why you have to take some chances. Take, take a little bit of risk, move your defensive line to the left or to the right, have some stunts, take advantage of the quickness of the undersized defensive line. The Knights believe that they will show defensive speed that Brom has not seen before this year. They played Miami. On third and long, Brom has plenty of time. Fires over the middle. It is complete to Arudia, who has a first down inside the 25. Another on-target throw by Brian Brom. Courtney Green there on the stop, 16 yards. Continuation of what we saw last week when Brom just carved up West Virginia. So efficient. And Rutgers, after first driving near midfield in its first possession, this is what they were afraid of. Louisville landing the big blow in their first play, 45 yards, and then a nice conversion on third down. What a scene here. But Louisville could quiet them all down if they could find the end zone here. Uh, now, now that Louisville is able to move the chains, look for them to attack on the first and ten. They've had a lot of success throwing the football. It's Smith straight up the middle, running through arm tackles and crawling to the 15. Gets eight. Smith, the ball carrier. Well, they, they, Chris, this time they're they're lining up in a three receiver set. They're moving the tight end that time to get in position. It's all about blocking angles. And Eric Wood, their center, one of the best in the Big second East, able to get to that second level and just a nice push. And the fact you have to almost guess with Louisville's defense with the run and versus the pass and the balance that they have it makes it tough on a defense to know what to expect the next play. Smith again. That's right. It's hammered at the 10, but will set up a first and goal for the Cardinals. Colby Smith, the guy replacing Michael Bush, who broke his leg way back in the Kentucky game early in the season. Such a shocking injury for this team, and Colby Smith took a long time to kind of adjust to the starter's role. He said he was really pressing. First down and goal. He's now, he was on the last couple yeah, of now that he's been more in instinctive, one of the other things that's helped him is number 42 coming into the game, the true freshman who's in now. Anthony Allen has much better size once they get inside the 10-yard line. Allen had a couple of touchdowns against West Virginia. 225 pounds out of Tampa. And a flag. Yeah, it's not just the passing game in Brown. They have different weapons in the backfield. Even though Bush goes out, you got Smith. We've seen Allen. Fire to the snap. 
False start. Number 81 on the offense. Five yard penalty. No first down. Scott Kuhn, the tight end, jumped offside. We haven't seen George Stripling yet, but we will. Three different kinds of backs for Brom to use. Yeah, they've got a great versatility, but the thing that you love to see out of Michael Bush is that even though he is out for the year, still heavily involved in getting this team focused. He's a roommate of Colby Smith, has been in an inspiration to this team despite the injury. So first and goal from the 15 after the penalty. That's Douglas in motion. Brown again, plenty of time, dumps it short to Douglas across the middle. Being chased down by the linebacker, Brandon Rankert, and dragged down at the three. So immediately, the speed of Harry Douglas finding creases in that Rutgers defense. Well, they're also doing a good job of just clearing out the zone. Great time here. What they do is they just simply clear out and then come underneath. You have your tight ends that are just doing their job as far as trying to get vertical. And look how the defense runs downfield with Kuhn, leaving a huge vacancy underneath, underneath for Harry Douglas to step into. Second and goal at the two. And after the big freshman who powers to the end zone, touchdown. Anthony Allen, right where he left off against the Mountaineers last week. And Shiano's defense marched on as Petrino's offense goes 80 yards in eight plays in about five minutes. That's one way to start off a, uh, a ball game when you rank third in the nation. You're on the road. There's a lot of pressure. Rutgers' biggest home game in the history of the school. You stop them, force the punt, get the ball. And drive 80 yards in eight plays. That's textbook on how you play on the road with pressure. Art Carmody still perfect on point afters. 40 for 40. And Brian Brom in that opening drive. 3 for 3. 74 yards. He got off to a great start with a 45-yard completion. Allen finishes the drive with a two-yard touchdown. Hi. ESPN's College Football Primetime is presented by Applebee's Neighborhood Grill and Bar. Eating good in the neighborhood. Applebee's. And in part by Circuit City. For the hottest new technology, think Circuit City. Just what I needed. Can't quite see the Statue of Liberty in New York Harbor from Rutgers campus, but it's not too far away from the city in terms of miles. Now, you get some traffic that can feel like the, uh, the longest 30-some mile drive you've ever taken. What a beautiful drive-in <laughs> yesterday from Newark, the airport. Did you enjoy that? Yeah. <laughs> you get some traffic now. That's when 37.8 can take an yeah, hour and a half. That was... Connecticut bored on it too far away. The point is, with, with that many people in this much you know, close proximity to the campus, there's plenty of prospects and players, and this is fertile recruiting ground, which Shiano has tried to emphasize and is starting to do so with a lot more success. We'll get into that. Yeah, yeah. Gr great point about the two-hour radius from this campus and how many high school football players are in this area. Flannery. Boots it to James Townsend, and he fights forward. We'll see what Rutgers can do in their second possession. Brahms already put him in a hole, and you know maybe confidence affected this Rutgers defense again. They've, they've really allowed no one over, over 20 points, Kirk, but this is a new thing yeah. for them. And the, the, the gentleman in the red shirt, the coach, the quarterback coach, Jeff Brahm, is the older brother of Brian Brahm. He will not let up. He is relentless, not only on the whole offense, but especially the guy right in front of him, number 12. We, we'll talk more about that throughout the game, but he, he and his younger brother have an interesting relationship, and it's been that way since he was about six years old until tonight in this game. Yeah, Brian was funny on that. Fly flies as Rice takes the pitch and bounces off the left side. You see a lot of number 27 if Rutgers can stay close. The game plan is ruined if they get way behind, and Louisville helps them out with a, a third five-yard penalty already in the first quarter. They've been so good at jumping on top of teams early, 58-7, to seven, and I think that, as much as anything, gives them confidence. That's why you wonder how they'll respond to Bobby Petrino and his team going down the field. 80 yards, eight plays, and a touchdown. They're used to being on top. And we even talked about before the game started how important it was for them to, after losing last year, 56-5. to five. They need some confidence. They need some success early. This is big. This drive right, right here to see how they respond to getting down by seven. Brian Leonard back in the game on first and five. 
The teal drops straight back, fires over the middle, overthrown, intercepted. It's intercepted by Gavin Smart. He was looking for Taekwon Underwood, and that is the ninth interception of the year for Teal. The ball is thrown to the inside, allowing Smart to make the jump on the ball, and he does a good job of playing the ball. And this is your fear if you're a Rutgers fan, is Teal gets back, puts the ball where he thinks his receiver is going to make a tighter angle to the middle of the field, and Underwood didn't come towards the middle of the field. He went more upfield vertically. Very simple for Smart, who had his eyes on the quarterback, to step up and make the pick. Rutgers defense really has to step up now. Colby Smith in motion to the top of the formation. Brian rolls. Gets pressure and throws it away. Early urgency for the second-ranked defense in the country. Brian Brom's strength is not rolling around outside of the pocket. It's sitting in the pocket. First play of the drive, last, the last drive, the opening drive, right downfield to Douglas, finding your Rudy underneath, or downfield in a seam, and then finding Douglas underneath. He was three for three. Accuracy is his greatest strength, and now that his thumb is fully recovered, let's keep an eye tonight on how many pass attempts that he makes and how many completions he has. He's one of the more accurate quarterbacks you'll see in the nation. On fake, hands off to Smith, he's stopped for a loss. That's that quick, undersized defensive line we talked about, William Beckford, Floridian, one of many in this roster, only 230 pounds, but you see the quickness. Chris, this is, this is an opportunity to see how the movement this time put him right into a position of making the play. He comes underneath. And the movement sometimes takes you to the play, sometimes takes you away from the play. And that time, it, it did a nice job of putting Becker right there where he could make a nice big tackle and set up third down. And third and 13, Brom, again, well protected. Flips over the middle, intercepted. Intercepted by Devon Thompson, the linebacker. Still spinning into Louisville territory. Out of bounds inside the 25. And that's a defense stepping up when they really had to. Not just stopping the possession, but setting up the offense now. But it's a great job of getting pressure on Brian Brom. He got pressure from his left side, and I think it affected his throw, and it allowed the ball to come down to Thompson, and Thompson does a good job of not only making the catch, but also doing a good job of running with the ball. That's just getting pushed right back into the pocket. The defensive pressure, Westerman, the defensive lineman, didn't actually get to him. He just pushed Foster right back in to Brian Brown. So Teal will throw on first down. Fires all the way, caught touchdown. Tyquan Underwood. Just a lightning quick turnaround in this game as Brian Brom gets an earful from big brother Jeff about the interception. Uh, he's been doing that since, since Brom stepped off the field after the interception. But kudos to Rutgers for taking advantage just exactly what they needed to get back into this football game. Sudden change, their defense steps up, gets the interception back. And how about Mike Teal, after having a horrific throw, steps right in, makes the big throw to tie this game up. Jeremy Ito tacks on the extra point. So Brown will go back to work. But now it's a 7-7 game, and the Rutgers house is rocking again. They're strong. Can you name a player on the Rutgers football team? That's sad. <laughs> I, I know his last name's got to be Williams. There's always a Williams there somewhere. His name escapes me for a second. I don't know anything about Rutgers. I don't even know what state the Rutgers are. <laughs> yeah, Ray Rice. Well, if you got a Times Square, they don't 90, know who. Ninety percent of the people aren't from New York in the first place. They don't know who Terrell Owens is. <laughs> they don't know what American football is. A lot yeah, of them. Yeah, but. Uh, what a scene here, about 40 miles from Midtown Manhattan, as Rutgers has gotten on the board, striking quickly. About 
four plays ago, Louisville had a seven-zip lead and the football after an interception of Teal and a very poor throw. Suddenly, the defense gets it back, and he makes a gutsy throw. That's exactly what had to happen for Mike Teal in this offense, is have some success like that and getting the ball down the field. At the end of the day, Teal has to make enough plays throwing the guys like Underwood to go back to their bread and butter, which is the running game. And by throwing, that sometimes can open up those running lanes. Jawan Spillman runs it out of the end zone for Louisville, has a crease. Beats the kicker and takes it to the house. No flags. And a huge gasp from this sellout crowd. Louisville's return game had given him nothing all season long until the West Virginia game. Until when you guy start, took, guy, we started killing their you special teams. You start killing teams. them. You know, the last two weeks we've seen them. They've been the best special teams in the country. Trito had a good thought, though. Law of averages. Sooner or later, we got to make a play. Yeah, I want you to watch number one talking about making a play. Ito, I think he's trying to turn him back to the middle of the field, but my friend, you've got you got to close the gap there a little bit, make a little bit of an effort. I, Spillman has such great speed but once he got out into the open lane it was uh, it was almost just tough to watch that poor kicker in the open field try to make that play it's blocked the extra point and they pick it up it's stripling trying to run it in the end zone and he gets in well Rutgers kind of fell asleep after blocking the kick and stripling able to run it in the one-point conversion so First of all, a, a, a nice job, and it's Allen, excuse me, the freshman who scored the touchdown earlier, picking it up and taking it in. There's so something heads you'll up see special every day. teams play again. We've had a lot of action here the last uh, last couple games that have happened fast, and right now we're in the middle of it. I, I'm surprised to see everybody from Rutgers <laughs> grab the ball, pal. It's just falling. It gets out of the way, and you know that's sometimes an instinct because you're so used to like on a punt to get away from the football. But that time, they get away from the ball, and Allen looks around thinking, I'm just going to pick it up and take it into the end zone and ends up con converting for the Cardinals. So a mental mistake from that Rutgers special teams unit. And now it's a 15-7 game. Another look. So the big block by Ramel Meekins, who had good penetration, but then they just kind of move out of the way. It's Frierson. Frierson. Yeah, Frierson just kind of even motioning to the whole defense, just everybody out of the way, out of the way. And what it allowed was Allen just to step up and, and pick up the ball. And now back to the sidelines, big brother, quarterback coach with Brian Brom. Now he's trying to pick up the pieces after he pretty tough on him after the interception. Now he's, okay, now we go, now we go. Now he's trying to get his his swagger back. I think he was just frustrated with his decision, obviously on the pick. But boy, what a what a change of events back and forth for all these teams. <laughs> Flannery to kick off, and it's a short one. Once again, James Townsend mishandles it momentarily and is forced out at the 16-yard line. Well, even though it happened just a few moments ago, I want you to look at the, how many people are up front for this Louisville defensive line. Nine defensive linemen are up tight. The reason that's important is they're trying to stop the run. But look at the middle of the field. That's why Teal has a chance, if he has time to throw, to get one-on-one -on -one opportunities against the Louisville secondary. The last time he was on the field, he was able to execute. Now let's see if that slows down some of the pressure from Louisville. He had nine offensive plays, Kirk. Six have been passes, which goes strongly against the pattern. Now they go back to plan A, and it's Rice, who's collared by Malik Jackson. The Sam linebacker flew in there and horse-collared the running back. Well, I think that's what, that's what Louisville and I think anybody else who plays Rutgers wants to see is do they have that kind of balance. They came into the night's game averaging 193 yards on the ground, 12th in the nation, the third leading rusher in the country, only 128 yards through the air, 114th in the nation. If you're playing, then you're going to put everybody up to try to stop that running game. Rutgers still has confidence they can run on anybody, but that'll be tested tonight. The blitz is picked up. Teal has time over the middle, incomplete, and laying a huge lick on the receiver was Brandon Sharp. Flag is down back at the line of scrimmage.
for 77 on the offense. Penalty is declined. It will be third down. It's the big junior. So, so watch the hit by yeah, Sharp. Well, they're, they're trying to get the ball to Underwood. And again, opportunity one-on-one. Boom. I think he dropped the ball because he knew what was coming. You come across the middle against any good defense, and you have to be ready to protect yourself. You know what's think, coming. You better look up and brace, man. <laughs> and, and Underwood, I think, knew that he had a safety, and Brandon Sharp closing in on him. The ball actually went through his hands before Sharp even had to hit him. Right side of the game is Leonard, the setback. There's a blocker on this third long, and it's caught by Underwood. Well, the young guy bounces right back, takes the big blow, but makes the third down catch before Gay forces him out. Gain of 12. Good toughness. Get lit up one play, come right yeah. back, make a nice hands catch the next. Yeah, and, and he is he has shown some toughness. The ball came loose after he made the catch. I was surprised to see how quickly they said it was a completion, because watch the ball come flying out. And now an official has run in and oh, overruled the initial call incomplete. It's a tough angle there. This will be a better angle. You'll see. Let's, I just want to see if he's able to hold the ball while he's... Now, that ball came yeah. out. It's a good call by the officials to correct the mistake on the field and, of course, it's a punt. But uh, you're right. It was a good effort there, but he gets hit I, again. I, I take it back because he <laughs> dropped the ball, okay? okay? So he wasn't that tough. Right. <laughs> Radigan needs a good punt here. Louisville brought pressure. Here's a pretty good kick. Taken at the 35 and firing straight ahead is Guy. Short return. So once again, this Rutgers defense on the spot. Down by eight because Juwan Spillman reversed momentum in this first quarter for the third time with the kickoff return for the touchdown. Now that poor kicker, you're right. <laughs> poor Ito. Yeah, and if you just join us, the Empire State Building often is lit up to salute the season or a special occasion. Rutgers Red tonight with the biggest game in the history of this campus. They must have some connections over there. Get that done. Brown, another first down throw. Tucks it and just gets a couple yards. Meekins chased him out. Brown will not set the world on fire as a runner. Well, he, he, that time he didn't have great protection, and it, the pocket closed in on him. Ramel Meekins uh, put the pressure, Chris, as you said. But one thing about Rutgers is they're third in the nation, almost four sacks per game. And because they're undersized, they will try to bring as much heat as they can to get to Brom before he can throw the ball downfield against the secondary. George Stripling in the game and gets the toss. The first carry for the speedy kind of change of pace back and not much, about a yard. LeBron Thompson will be the interception there on the stop. Well, Brom opened the game going three for three and taking the team right down the field. And then this last time out, he had a line, offensive lineman come back into his face and threw the pick. And his quarterback coach happens to be his older brother. Spent about 10 minutes getting it into his head and letting him know. I mean, he did not stop. We asked Brian about that, and he said, yeah, he's pretty much been that way since I was in Pee Wee. <laughs> Just been the relationship that I've had with him. And he's always pushing, always trying to challenge me to do the right thing and make good decisions. It's Douglas in motion. Brian looks that way over the middle, and then Douglas had to work his way back to the outside, incomplete. Yeah, Brian said Jeff had a, had a very unusual reaction for him. Well, the West Virginia way. Well, we uh -huh. yeah, yeah, yeah. So he gave him a hug. <laughs> We've talked a lot about how do you stop Brian Brown? You get him like any quarterback where he has a little bit. He's starting to feel the heat, starting to feel the pressure. That's the one way to get Brian Brown out of his comfort zone is if you can consistently get people in traffic coming towards his body. And they've done that the last two drives. Louisville's punter is Corey Getchy. Took over duties a few games ago. Willie Foster, it's a fake. The up snap and a first down. Breaking into the secondary, Louisville special teams at Nate Harris, the middle linebacker, took this snap and burst forward for 16 yards. 
Rutgers thought they would have an edge in special teams. Hasn't worked out that way. Well, th they snapped the ball to the up back, which is, to me, pretty amazing to see that this, the conference they have. Preston Smith, a linebacker, hands to another linebacker. They have a guy coming around faking a reverse. Kudos to Bobby Petrino for calling that. I want to say Bobby Stoops because he reminds me of Bob Stoops for being aggressive with the way he's attacking on the road. I love it. First down at the Rutgers 40. Another test for this defense. Colby Smith. Hit hard after a short game. Thompson. He's having a terrific first quarter there with the stop. Aaron, pretty good first quarter for Brian Brom. Yeah, but remember, guys, what Greg Schiano, Rutgers head coach, told us. He is the difference maker. He said Brom is the best quarterback I've ever faced, I've ever had my team face. And he said the best way to compete against him is keep his rear end, quote, unquote, on the sidelines, guys. Here's the Big East Offensive Player of the Year last year, second in passing efficiency. And he's back in top form after that thumb surgery. And Smith again on second down. Quick burst off the left side. For Eric Foster made the stop. Talk about quarterback play in this conference. Not looking that. Ex Syracuse quarterback. Jay Smith, the tight end NFL field after he played at Rutgers and Donovan making the short trip up I-95 to the campus to take in the big game. Smith is right. Boy, was it fun to see Donovan McNabb play quarterback in college. I know he's a great pro quarterback, but I think he was that much more exciting when he was at Syracuse running the option and having such a great offense in his day for the Big Orange. Eagles get that beleaguered Washington defense as they try to stop their slide this weekend. On third and three, a timeout. Take it on the field. A very big third down play. See if Rutgers can get the stop. Louisville trying to build on its lead here. Superb on special teams in the first quarter. They have the Spillman kickoff return for a touchdown. They get the two-point conversion on the blocked PAT run in by Allen. They just convert a fake punt on a run by Nate Harris for a first down. Now it's third and three for Louisville at the Rutgers 33 as we start the second quarter. Brown trying to impose itself on Braun. Smith next to him in the shotgun. Brom steps back, well protected, flips near sideline, and Rudia is battling with the corner, Jason McCourty, incomplete. It was funny to watch those two going back and forth. If you're going to call pass interference on one of them, you're going to have to call it on both of them. They were some serious fighting with the hands, trying to get into position to make the play. But at the end, it's good coverage, and not a shock. Louisville will go for it here on fourth and three would be about a 50-yarder, and that's within Art Carmody's range, but Petrino, three for six on fourth down this season. Crucial. Smith on the stretch play, bites inside the 31st down. Five yards is a wall of blockers on the left side. Makes it first and ten for Louisville. What a great push. When on fourth and three by that left side of the offensive line. They brought Barnage over the tight end. They caught a break as far as the personnel. They only had three defensive linemen in. And the big boys up front for the Cardinals offense just pushed the undersized Scarlet Knights defensive front out of the way. Ron fires to the end zone off the hand of Douglas. Beat Brandon Reichart, the linebacker coming out of the slot, just missed him. He's going to resave us in the studio for a 30 and 30 update. All right, Chris, Joe Paterno will not coach Penn State Saturday against Temple. Paterno still recovering from the injury he suffered when he was on the sideline and was collided, uh, collided with a couple of players as they came out of bounds. They don't want to jeopardize his recovery. We'll have more on that at halftime. Sports Center after the game, ESPN News, right now. Yeah, Joe's been a terrible patient. Very impatient patient in the hospital. It's Smith on the delay. Add 
gets popping as he gets down inside the 20. Courtney Green on the stop. He's near the first down. Another great job by the left side of the offensive line. Jamal Westerman, the defensive end, gets pushed inside and sealed by Bussey. Watch this open up. I think they're thinking pass. They start to as much movement as they have. That's an example of how the movement can take you away from the play. And that time, big gain there for Smith. Already 130 total yards for this Louisville offense. They give it back to Allen. Rutgers defense again allowing only 227 yards per game. Louisville at a buck 33 and we're a minute into the second quarter. Yeah, well this is one of the more high powered offenses in the country and now that Brian Brom is, is healthy even though he's not having a great start so far matter of time so he'll probably find his rhythm and what they've done is they're relying more now on just running the football. Brom has missed his last five pass attempts. And Smith as blockers out in front, Colby Smith. Another first down. This is more than just a fancy passing offense. They can get up, they can get tough when they need to. They, they can get tough. And what I love is to see a center who's got the athletic ability and toughness to get out in the open field. 77. Eric Wood out of Cincinnati. He comes downfield. Look at this. Look at the seams that they're able to find there. And if you're going to play offensive line for the Louisville Cardinals, you better not only be big, but you better be athletic because they move you around quite a bit. They have big Allen set eight yards deep behind the quarterback, gets the handoff and plows to the five. George Johnson, the true freshman defensive end on the stop. Rutgers really has to make a stand here to avoid falling two touchdowns behind. What's amazing is you, you look at the score and you look at where Louisville is about to go in again. You think, boy, this is kind of what you expect as far as if you think Louisville's offense is scoring. But Rutgers has played pretty well. Rice has been on the sideline, hasn't had a chance to have a big impact. But Rutgers has held up pretty well for their defensive front so far. Second and goal. Brom still's got it. Deflected at the line, incomplete. Eric Foster, the defensive tackle, able to get the big hand up. Foster's the guy that said Brom will see defensive speed and schemes he hadn't seen all season long. He was very confident. He'll smack before the game. Good hops to create the deflection. Yeah, he was a little trash talking during the coin flip, but he had to make a decision. Do I let do I come off of Allen and give Brom the throw? Or do I sit back on Allen because nobody else is out there? He decides to let go of Allen, put the pressure on Brom, and got a hand up to deflect the ball. Building goal. Across the middle, touchdown. It's Jimmy Riley, the senior from Youngstown, with his first career touchdown. He'd been a career special teamer. Finally, got in a game last week, had a chance to make an impact against West Virginia. Now his first career touchdown. What a well-designed route. Riley comes from the inside, goes out, and then comes back underneath. And it was actually Douglas clearing the way as the outside receiver. The linebacker fell with him, and a huge void right there for Riley to get his first score. This time, no adventure in the PAT. Carmody knocks it through, and Rutgers is in a 15-point hole early in the second quarter. The crowd has taken a seat. The offense needs to spark them. This guy provided sparks on the Rutgers campus way back. Dickie V, ex-Rutgers coach, has a connection to Rick Shiana. We'll visit with Dickie V coming up. So Louisville striking on special teams, getting very efficient offensive play, running the ball. Brian Brom had, had six straight incompletions until that touchdown catch by Riley. And I think Big Brother's happy now with Brian Brom, and it's 10 runs and only five passes. But his big thing, what he was talking about, was getting back there, making a decision, and stepping through. Even a great quarterback like Brian Brom still needs to work on the little things, the fundamentals, and a little reminder who's there, his quarterback coach and Big Brother, always to remind him. A little reminder, is that what it is? That yeah, I think that's what we'll call it. We'll call it that. <laughs> a little reminder. He worked him over. Well, way back in the day, Rutgers was 
more of a, a basketball school. A guy named Dick Vitale was the coach here, a, a Jersey guy himself, and he joins us on the phone. And Dick, you have a connection with Greg Schiano's family, I know. Well, you know, Chris, uh, his mom and dad were so special. Uh, Barry Schiano and Renee Baldecki was his mom. She was a cheerleader, and I had a crush on her. Unbelievable. <laughs> but she wouldn't give me a shot, Chris. I wasn't good-looking like you in Herb Street. So she never gave me a chance. But I'm going to tell you this. If he had half the enthusiasm of his mom and dad, you knew he was going to be a star. When I found out that he was the son of those two people, I said, they got a winner down at Rutgers, and what a winner. He's been able to sell players on a vision, Dick. Did you think you'd ever see a football game at Rutgers involving two undefeated teams in November? They have never played a ranked versus ranked game before in football here. Well, you know what it is. He has that mentality that he believes that you can get great players out of New Jersey, New York, and certainly the metropolitan area, and even down in Florida with his connection from down in Miami. And I remember when I was an assistant there back in the early 70s, the mentality of the people was always that they thought they were mediocre. And if you think you're mediocre, you'll be mediocre. And I tried to come in. They wanted me to recruit guys that look like you, Chris. And I said, who are we going to be? We're going to be Columbia? I want to be Kentucky and North Carolina. Well, Rutgers is just trying to hang on here, Dick. You have C2 running plays from, from Rice and then Leonard, and now it's going to be third and long. You know, just, just, you know what? You know, I love what he's done, and I know Dick Lloyd, who gave me my great chance. His brother Bobby played with Jimmy Valvano, and Jimmy, I know, would be smiling like crazy seeing Rutgers where they are today. But we came in, we recruited kids like Phil Sellers and Mike Dabney, and they went to the Final Four in 1976. Tom Young added to that group and got James Bailey and Copeland and those guys. And that's what Chiano's doing. Greg is a great, great choice for that job. That was the year 76 when the football team went undefeated as well. On third and long, Teal incomplete. It was dropped by Britt over the middle. And the big hits that Louisville's been unleashed on these receivers may be in their head. That's another drop. Yeah, that's another drop over the middle of the field. We saw one earlier when Underwood came across, and he knew that Brandon Sharp was going to close in on him. And this time it's the freshman, true freshman, Kenny Bread, who Greg Schiano tells us he's getting better and better and more of an understanding like most freshmen. It takes some games and some experience, but that time he was open. He just has to secure the football. Boy, here, Dick, Dick, hearing your voice, I'm ready for some college hoops. I can't wait. We start on Monday, but I can tell you this, you know, that isn't it sad, though? And I know you guys don't want to buy this. I try to argue with my man, Mr. Fowler, all the time. Isn't it sad that one of these clubs could finish unblemished and the winner of the Ohio State-Michigan game goes unblemished and they may not get a chance to play for a national title? How sad is that? That's why in college basketball, we're light years ahead of what they do in football. Hey, I got one I knew you were going there eventually. If we if we kept you on the phone long enough, you'd go. I agree with you, this system means. Well, let me ask you this. Tell, let me, ask you, well, let me ask you this. What's worse, Dick, having our system where the BCS, where every week and every game matters, and then I know the system's flawed at the end of the year, or having March Madness where the three weeks of March are the greatest thing that there is, but what happens in December and January and February are meaningless. Well, it doesn't matter. You can't tell me it's meaningless because they're compiling a resume to be one of the 65 teams. Anytime you have a team like Auburn two years ago who runs the table in the SEC and they don't play for a national title, you can't tell me that the system's not flawed. The system is more than flawed. Hey, Dick, we can't sort it out in this phone call. Look forward to the start of college hoop season, and thanks for joining us tonight. Hey, thanks a lot. And Mr. Shiano and Petrino sounds like the Linguini Bowl. <laughs> well, Italian last night in the place. He yeah, saw Quintero Frierson get his hand of the ball as Brom misfired there on first down. The rare misfire when they've thrown on first down. He's been very sharp and very successful against Shiano's defense. Three in the play clock. They just snap it in time. Brom fades back. It's a screen dumped off to Smith. He cuts it back and falls forward for a nice game. Thompson there on the stop. It'll set up third and two. Let's go to Aaron Andrews for a report. Well, guys, I was standing behind the defensive line bench there for Rutgers, and they were hearing it pretty good from their coach. He was saying it's not about X's and O's at this point, guys. It's about the individual battles. you got to come off the line of scrimmage and blitz, and you got to get to the ball carrier. Who cares? They've been 
able to convert these third down and shorts pretty easily. Allen fights for it. It'll be very close to the marker at the 40. That was 225 pounds. A freshman running back meeting the offensive line. The crowd booing this spot. The Mel Meekins on the stop. And the chains have to come out here. The yellow line says he's got it. I'm not so sure that if you eyeball where the chain is on the far side, it's that clear cut. And it's a very, it's going to be a very close call, and you can see between Taylor leading the way and Allen. Taylor, 245 pounds, is a leading fullback, and Allen coming in at about 230. First down. Yep. That, depending on the angles that we have, if Greg Schiano really wanted to push the issue there, he could check to see of what kind of spot it was. See that Louisville dominating in yards on the ground. Rutgers really has never get, you know, been in its regular offensive game plan tonight, throwing early and often, and now they're way behind. Brown has time, fires deep. It's Douglas who shoves the man aside, makes the catch inside the 20-yard line. He beat Manny Collins, and now the crowd's going to get even more agitated. A little, little contact there as the junior receiver created some space and hauled it in for 39 yards. Well, they, Rutgers decided to blitz, and when you blitz, you're leaving your corners on an island out there. Manny Collins gets a little push. There's no question there was a push by Douglas, but why leave it into the hands? Why leave it in the hands of an official? Look at the blitz coming from the far right. It's picked up that time. Nice job by the offensive line. The backs doing their job, and you're right. Douglas gets away with a little bit of a push, but it's nonetheless a big game for this Cardinal offense again. Three catches already for Harry Douglas. And you see Smith on the delay. Flying up into the hole to make the stop is Ron Gerald, the safety. But again, he makes the stop about six yards downfield. With the running and throwing of what Louisville can do, they've doubled over double amount of plays at this point. Of what Rutgers had a chance. They're keeping the ball away from Ray Rice. Look at time of possession. Clearly a huge advantage for the Cardinals. Now they're going to go with a quick snap here, trying to catch him off guard. It's 31 plays with a kickoff return for a touchdown factored into that, remember. And flags will fly the left side of the Louisville offensive line misfiring. <laughs> Already that Rutgers defense been out there a long time. Prior to the snap, false start, number 76 on the offense, five-yard penalty, remains second down. You want a nitpick, that's the fourth little kind of execution five-yard penalty they've had in this first half. There you go. But that's nitpick. <laughs> Maybe some voters will look at that and say, oh, oh they're they, not they, that they good. execute well. See, they have to keep having the penalties. Yeah, well, watch Florida's offense. <laughs> They have been struggling ex with their execution. We'll talk about whether well, there's a double standard at work and how Louisville is evaluated for some other teams later on tonight. Back to second and nine. Bonnage, the tight end, in motion. Goes to the flats. Ball knocked loose. Brown dives to the floor and gets it back. So the ball knocked out of Brian Brown's hands by Javon Thompson at the interception earlier, but he falls on it. Third and long. They keep blitzing. ESPN and ABC team up to bring you the top two teams in the nation. A week before the big showdown in Columbus, 3.30 Easter, Troy Smith and the Bucks travel to Evanston. And then on ESPN, Chad Henney and the Wolverines visit Indiana. So ABC and ESPN featuring the Bucks and the Wolves there a week away from that big collision. Smith on the delay, third and 14. They run it, and he gets nowhere near a first down. <laughs> Courtney Green on the stop, and we'll see a field goal attempt. Bobby Petrino, they, they were able to get into a third and long early in the game, and they hit Yerudia for a first down. This time, he just trying to pick up as many yards as he can, give his kicker a chance to make this uh, field goal. And Art Comedy taking over the Louisville record for scoring in a career. He can knock this through, and he does it. The lefty, very solid, and the special teams for Louisville have been superb tonight. What a Chiano's team, 
falls in a bigger hole now, 25-7 midway in the second quarter. Shiano, not the first coach to take a leap of faith when he came here to Rutgers. We'll visit with women's basketball coach Vivian Stringer, who did just that. Coming up. Bird. ESPN's College Football Primetime, brought to you by Allstate. Are you in good hands? And the Home Depot. You can do it. We can help. Welcome back to Rutgers. All the buildup here, all the enthusiasm, but Rutgers in a deep hole now, not with an offense built for the comeback down 18. No, no that's why it was 6.34 to go here in the half. They have to be able to put something together to be able to get back in this game. Remember, they took the ball to start the game, so Louisville will have the choice. Obviously, they'll take the ball to start the second half. With that in mind, Mike Teal and the Scarlet Knights will have to uh, try to put something together in these final six minutes. We'll see if they can make a play on special teams. It's been Louisville dominant in that situation early. On the return, James Townsend has some really not so positive play. It'll get good field position for this Rutgers offense across the 40. 36 yards for Townsend. Well, that's the field position that they needed, and we'll see if Mike Teal can take advantage of it. This is just now, once again, Kirk, becoming a, a good football school. It's been a strong women's basketball school for a while, and, and Vivian Stringer now joins us, the coach of the Scarlet Knights. She's taken three different teams to the Final Four. You kind of took a leap of faith coming here a little bit from Iowa and, and making an investment in this place. What, what Shiano has done as well, when he took this job, it wasn't a great football job. You, you see something of a parallel as a program builder? Well, I'll tell you what, when you've got a great university as we have, and you have the kind of administrative support, and you're in the area of the country that we are in, you have to know that the great things can happen and I think that uh, Greg just methodically built the program in the right way with good people and great support. You've seen a lot of coaches. Do you see kind of the spark in him? He's able to make players believe when it seems illogical what he's trying to sell them sometimes. Yeah, because he's, he's able to help them to see the dream that he has, and there's no reason. Rutgers is a sleeping giant. New Jersey is a sleeping giant. So his attitude is, let's you know, if you want to be the best, let's bring the best here, and we're in the best part of the country. Coach, what do you think it is that maybe people that aren't familiar with this area don't realize that Rutgers can take advantage of? Is, is it resources? Is it is it athletic ability? Um, first of all, I think that some of the greatest players in the, in the in the country have come from the state of New Jersey. It's supplied some of the top 20 programs always in in men and women's basketball, and certainly in football. And there goes our Scarlet Knights. Yeah, you're, there I, you go. That's not. You're you're allowed to cheer in the press yeah, box. I'm sorry, we're, I can't we're, help we're going to be objective, but, but you're allowed to cheer. That's Cordell Young. He's the young back. He's the back of the future. Ray Rice's understudy gets in there, takes the pass from Teal. 39 yards later, that's the spark the offensive uh, team for Rutgers needs. I like the fact. That they moved Young, who, as Chris, you said, has great speed. He's a tailback. They moved him out to the slot. Just not a whole lot of uh, sophistication to what they tried to do. They're just able to catch Louisville off guard and coming underneath with a, kind of that, that uh, tunnel screen that you see so many of the spread offenses run. And at time, boy, what a big play. And the timing could not have been any better for the Scarlet Knights offense. You said this is not an offense built for the quick comeback, but they need points in a hurry. Now it's Rice. He's around the corner. Ray Rice headed to the end zone. Yes. Touchdown. <laughs> Coach Stringer saying yes to the plot. You got good timing. Oh, I mean, I tell you, how, how much better can it be? Good Our luck. They're going to be fine. Our Scottie Knights are going to be fine. Good, good luck charm around here. Oh, I'll tell you, I'm a great football fan, and in particular of the Scarlet Knights. We're going to take care of things. Well, 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 thanks for joining us tonight. Best of luck for your basketball season as you guys get set to get underway. Thank you so much, and go Scarlet Knights. Appreciate it. You, you may not want to leave three or four <laughs> plays, and she puts the ball in the end zone. Yeah, we're going to have to stay here a little bit longer. <laughs> Ray Rice's 14th rushing touchdown on the season. Jeremy Ito, and that was a quick strike drive, Kirk. 59 yards like in three said, plays. Their offense is not equipped and built to score in a hurry. Captain Barger. Snap, false start, number 90 on the offense, five yard penalty. Coach Finger wants to hang around. She, she, she likes well, it. She should. <laughs> Either that or go down on the sideline. Just four plays. She's up here with <laughs> Try the PSC again. Big kickoff return. And found the backup. Cordell Young on a, on a screen. It was a nice little wrinkle, wasn't it? Oh, the backup sure tailback who and really it, hadn't touched the ball yet tonight. It's also nice to see Ray Rice, who, if there's one player that America is familiar with on the Rutgers team, it is Ray Rice. 
and that was the first time we've had a chance to see him unveiled and you can see that burst that he has that low center of gravity how tough it is to bring him down he's a very sturdy back Eats on no problem on the conversion from five yards further back Shiano's team back within 11 as Rice finds the end zone Broadcast on ESPN HD presented by Pioneer Plasma Displays. Ray Rice, who averages 28 carries per game, busiest tailback in the nation on average. Only five carries tonight, but he finds the end zone. Rice, if he'd had a monster game, Kirk, many believe could join the conversation as a Heisman finalist, just take the train to the ceremony in New York City, perhaps, even as a sophomore, but it's been a quiet night for him so far. It has been, but maybe this will be the the run that's able to spring him into the second half. Chris, 28 carries a game. Yeah. I mean, you think about being 5'9 and about 195 pounds, that's chopping a lot of wood for that young back. <laughs> the deep kickoff taken by Spillman. Did he do it again? He was tripped up as he crossed the 20. Just keep but he ripping. had a crease. Keep ripping on this Louisville special teams. They seem to like We that. woke him up, see, last yeah, week. He motivated there you go. them. There you go. Wake Forest is awake this year. A big game in Tallahassee, leading the Atlantic Division, sharing it anyway as they visit the Knolls. Others will see Texas try to keep the BCS title game hopes alive as they take on Kansas State on the road. That was a team, of course, that Louisville beat without Brian Brom at quarterback. So people will look and see how did Texas handle Kansas State compared to how Louisville went, winning by 18. Cardinals right back to work. Initial penetration blows the play up, and then Stripling is chased down. Fires in a good first half. He sure has, and I'll tell you, this, this series, we just talked about how important it was for Rutgers to get on the board before half. We didn't realize they would score so quickly. Greg Schiano's offense doing a good job, and now he's got to rely on his defense to come up with a stop. It doesn't have to be three and out. But come up with a stop and do not allow Brian Brown to move the ball down the field and get points. Louisville gets the ball to start the second half. Brown in the flex. It's caught by Smith. The two Scarlet Knights converge and make the stop. Brandon Reichert with the hit. The junior from right here in Piscataway. Uh, anytime you play Louisville, the importance of making a tackle in the open field is paramount. That time, Rankert, it was there alongside with McCourty, the corner. So it was a two-on-one. Rankert did not hesitate at all. He just lowered the boom. He's been a very active uh, player for this Rutgers defense in the second half. He's a hybrid, kind of a safety linebacker type guy. Rutgers may have some time to do more damage if they can get the stop here on third and 13. Brown pressure throws it away. They brought the blitz. Devin McCourty, the safety, got there in a hurry. And now they're up again, waving their towels. Rutgers will get the football back, could have decent field position. Well, that's what Greg Schiano, that's the trademark defense. The energy, the speed, the athletic ability. We talked to him yesterday and we said, what are the strengths of your defense? He talked about speed and the understanding of the concepts and confidence. That's exactly what you saw in those three plays. Billy Foster, the senior from Miami, is deep for the Scarlet Knights. Low snap, the ball partially blocked at the line of scrimmage. They throw a flag, but did they get the football? That would wave off the penalty. It was Lee Glenn who got in there. Oh, roughing the kicker, number six on the defense. 15-yard penalty from the line of scrimmage. First down. Chiano complaining the pass, the punt was deflected. It was Glenn charged with the personal foul. Have a look. It's just a matter of whether or not they got a hand on the ball because they came in there and without question Lee roughed him. I don't think there was a hand on the football. Tough to tell from that angle. Boy, what, a, Lee. what a tough break with all this momentum and all this confidence. Lee's hand came close, but I don't think he made contact with the ball. And then he ran right into the punter. 
But only went 15 yards. Is yeah, it possible well, that he, you know, could have gone that low with it without it being deflected? I think he was just hurrying to try to get the ball out of there before the pressure got to him, and he did a good job of getting it out. But Rutgers, exactly what they did not want to happen to give Brian Brown the ball back. And now, Rutgers will call a timeout. Rutgers, that is your first timeout of the half. Is what's at stake for Louisville. They vaulted up to number three in the BCS standings after beating West Virginia last week. Margin fairly comfortable for now over Florida, but I think most would agree, and the human polls make up two-thirds of it, that style points count a lot. Yeah, and what I thought was interesting this week is seeing the separation now between Florida and Texas. I mean, you're talking about... Two thousands of a point. Yeah, you're talking about it. it it's going to come down week to week between those two teams if Louisville ends up falling out of the picture. Well, if they keep winning. I mean, Texas yeah. has a oh, much yeah. easier path than Florida, right? Of course, of course. I think the Florida-Florida State game is setting itself up for a, a classic showdown. Here's the thing, too. If you want to look at uh, how one team affects another, it actually benefits Louisville and their chances of getting to the BCS championship game if Texas keeps winning. Because Texas could be a buffer in the human polls. Right now, they're right, right behind Louisville. If they yeah. don't lose, they won't drop. Right. But their computer isn't very good. They're not going to be playing highly ranked teams down the line in the Big 12, including the conference championship game. So they don't have a chance to really boost themselves in the computers. It helps Louisville if Texas keeps winning and doesn't drop in the polls. You've been talking to Brad Edwards. You sound pretty dialed in there. Well, Brad Edwards I is a good source for that stuff. He is. He's yes. the best. I watched him. Uh, I think it was on Tuesday. He was breaking all the information down regarding the BCS and the computers and the what's to ex what to expect in, re in future weeks. ESPN.com has all that stuff. Yes, all over. yes, it does. Brad does a good job. On first down after the defensive timeout, a quick burst over the left side by Smith near midfield. Eric Foster on the stop. Let's go, and we'll see if Louisville can add on more points before halftime. We'll check in with Reese Davis. All right, Chris, coming up on the Pontiac Performance Halftime Report, we'll break down who the best of the one-loss teams are, also tell you why neither Michigan nor Ohio State should worry about a letdown, and give you an update on Joe Paterno's condition. All coming up at the half. Chris, thank you. First down for the Cardinals now. 240 and running in the first half. Ron fires complete to Arudia, who's hit quickly. Five-yard gain, McCourty in the stop. Well, when you blitz as much as Rutgers' defense is blitzing, especially in a two-minute offense, when when Ryan Brom has a chance, if they protect, you're leaving your corners and safeties on an island one-on-one, -on -one. and that is is a tough thing to do. Eventually, Brian Brom, you can see who he, who has helped him along the way. His, of course, his father played at Louisville. His brother. Jeff was a quarterback at Louisville, now he's quarterback coach. Matter of time, though, he hurts you one-on-one. -on -one. Well, Brown will be sworn there. Jamal Westerman got him. But true to his colors, Greg Schiano says, yeah, you know, you're right. Maybe we're taking a little bit of a risk, but this is what we do. We believe in putting pressure on a quarterback, and that's just confidence from a head coach and slash defensive coordinator that he thinks he can get to Brian Brom before Brom can make that defensive backfield pay for the one-on-one -on -one coverage. On third down, incomplete. So Rutgers has had pretty good success on third down tonight, stopping Louisville. And only two for nine. Of course, they had the two fourth down conversions in that one drive, including the fake punt. I'm telling you, that is a huge, huge series for Rutgers after the three and out, the momentum back, the crowd into the game. Then they roughed the punter, giving Brian Brom and a Cardinals offense the, off, the ball back. They pick up a first down. You're thinking, here they go. And then they'll be able to come up with a stop, assuming they don't pull off a fake punt. <laughs> It's Foster, and we'll just let this one bounce. And a nice job. Getchy knocks it dead at the four all the way around. Just a superb night for Louisville special teams. 45-yard punt knocked dead at the five. Just like the scouting report says. They've been bad until last week. <laughs> right. The numbers don't lie. They hadn't had a kick return. They hadn't had a punt return. 
Meanwhile, they weren't very good in net punting. And they, yeah, they, and they, what did you what you call it? A little. Uh, a little scolding, a little... Whatever, you had a nicer word for it, but Big Brother got after Little Brother there, so a little, little consultation, advice. a little advice, little consultation. Advice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I would have, he's still, he's still down there going after him. I, I just wonder if Jeff, Jeff, it's so easy when it's your own blood, it's your own younger brother who you've been doing that with, if he, if he gets after Hunter Cantwell and the other quarterbacks as much as he gets after Brian. So Shiano will hand it off straight ahead here to Rice. That, that rough in the kicker really cost Rutgers a chance to do something here. You know, they, they, time was lost, and of course, field position was gained. Their Under Armour advantage in the first half. Jawan Spillman had that 100 yard kickoff return for a touchdown. When Rutgers had momentum, this, this guy's return took it right back for the visitors. It was a huge play, and it's interesting to see Louisville now calling a timeout. They're trying to see if they can force Rutgers into a punt. All right, we'll come back. Last minute of the first half. Best-selling author, successful business owner, star chef, and make cool friends. It all starts at Rutgers, New Jersey State University. From the classics to the cutting edge, wherever life takes you, Rutgers is your foundation for success. This is better than what you cooked in college. See what Rutgers does for you? Rutgers, the State University of New Jersey. Teaching, exploring, leading with a passion. Here's the snap it on second and five. Well, he stumbles forward to the 10. We'll see if Louisville burns another timeout. Oh, yeah, there, there's no doubt about that. Shiano counseling Teal. Chopping wood, just keep after it. That's their shorthand expression for maintaining focus and going back to work. It all started after the Illinois game last year on the road where they, they came close. They were competitive, still trying to build this program, get the kids to believe it can work. And he said, guys, we're in a forest. There's just a bunch of trees around us. Let's just keep our head down and just keep chopping. Keep chopping wood. And their team last year getting to a bowl game after a 7-4 and four year, I think really impacted and validated what Greg Schiano was trying to do at Rutgers. And I think it got the entire team to buy in in the offseason. I think it's, it created a lot of confidence when they came into this year. Well, they're going to have to chop some wood in the second half here. Yeah, there's, a, there's some redwoods chop, here. The lead is, yeah. There's some redwoods here in the second half. Uh, they've had uh, some breakthrough games here. This is the game against Pittsburgh in October. It was a three-game road trip for the Scarlet Knights. This is a game that you know many thought they'd be exposed on defense by Palco. He was number one in passing efficiency coming into the game. They hit him. They knocked him around. And they did not allow any big plays, really. You know, and I, Ray Rice, I think, and the, and the Scarlet Knights got on the map nationally after this game, going on the road and showing that they could play with a team that at that point was playing with a lot of confidence. 39 carries for Rice in that game for 225. Yeah, 116 in the fourth quarter alone. Yeah, that's what. That's probably the belief that they have now from that game. They're going to talk about that at half. Well, Rice is able to muscle forward for a first down, so at least they avoid having to punt the ball back to Louisville here. And because of the game plan from Rutgers, because they've tried to put the game into the hands of Mike Teal early in the game, they've gone away from their strength, which is Ray Rice, and tried to break some tendencies throwing the football. And we really have not seen as much of Rice as we, we thought coming into the game that we might see. That's only his eighth carry. Talking about a young man who's used to carrying it 28 times a game. He's got the 42 yards and the one touchdown. Clock running down. Now neither team interested in stopping it. You're going to have to stop it. Well, they just want to avoid the delay of game penalty. Yeah. But they can stop it one more time. And again, you mentioned Louisville is going to get the ball to start the second half and another pressure possession for that Rutgers defense to try to end. Well, I, as far as a grade that I would give Greg Schiano's defense, uh, I would probably give him an A- minus or B+. Plus. When you hold Brian Brom to 8 of 17 for 133 yards with an interception and a touchdown, that's, I'll tell you, that's a pretty, that's a pretty good effort in the first half against Brom in this offense. You know, Schiano had an interesting shore earlier this week. He was a pizza delivery guy. On Tuesday, check this scene out. 10,500 Rutgers tickets distributed in about four hours. And many had camped out on Monday oh night. Shiano wades in there and 
brings like 50 pizzas, which were swallowed up instantly. They don't have this kind of thing on this campus. That, that, that's a first. Just to get in here, you're allowed a free ticket as part of your student fee. For your 20 grand tuition, you, you ought to get a free ticket, frankly. It's pretty expensive to go to school here. But, you know, 10,500 cool tickets though. in four hours. That was a great Great scene. to see. We were here, we got in here nice and early, three hours before, and the students were already in here with the general admission seating filed all the way to the top of the student section. If you could factor out special teams, it'd be a pretty even first half, but you can't. Louisville's special teams were superb. Ray Rice had the one touchdown, but Spillman, the kickoff return for a touchdown, a huge part of this first half. Cardinals had the lead. Let's go to Aaron. Take the lead to the locker room, but Rutgers defense really turning it up the last couple of series. What are they doing against your offense? Yeah, we got to protect the quarterback better. They started blitzing and hitting Brian a little bit, and we got to be more accurate throwing the ball, get better protection, and bust some on the runs. We're real close to breaking a couple long runs. All right, thank you so much. Bet. On special teams, not just the Spillman return, but also the fake punt executed, the block PAT run in for a two-point conversion by Allen, and it's 25-14, number three Louisville over unbeaten Rutgers. Back to Reese Davis now in the studio for our Pontiac Performance Halftime Report. Reese. All right, Chris, glad to have you along with us here at halftime. Louisville hanging on to that 11-point lead. Lou Holtz, Mark May alongside, and Chris alluded to it. He showed you all the special teams plays that Louisville made. We always say big games must be sound in the kicking game. And Louisville definitely was, and that was an advantage that they were taking aware of over Rutgers. And the reason why is because they were extremely well prepared in this game, starting off with a kickoff return by Jawan Spillman, 100 yards on this return. I think that was key to spark this offense. He had tremendous blocking up front. That's what got it, but his tremendous speed did it for him. And now this is heads up play. Johnny on the spot. Being aware, if you're out there on extra point field, if it's blocked, pick it up and run it in. It's live. And then the next one, the fake punt. If you're Bobby Petrino, this is a great call, a gutsy call, gets the first down. But I'll tell you what, Tom McMahon, the special teams coach, if they win this football game and hold out and win, they have to give him a game ball because he's the one that really kept him in this game and put him ahead, actually. Yeah, the two-point conversion that uh, Louisville was able to run in, had the ball going past the line of scrimmage, okay. couldn't advance it anymore, so it was a heads-up play with the Rutgers players, a little bit caught in between. What have you seen in the first half? Well, I think Rutgers is a very fine football team, but what happens to so many teams when you have an open day? You put too much in. They've gotten away from what made them good, and that is running Ray Wright. He averages 28 carries a game. In the first half, with only a minute to go, he had a total of six carries. That's not the way Rutgers are going to win. All right, second half, you think he gets it more close enough now, well, right? He has to. That's the guy. That's what got him there. You dance with who brung you. <laughs> 25-14 at halftime. Coach Mark and I will continue our tango through halftime because we brung each other here, right? We'll tell you who the best one-loss teams are, the burning questions so far on the season. We'll also give you an idea why neither the men in the winged helmets nor the Buckeyes need to worry about a letdown. The Pontiac Performance Halftime Report is powered by Pontiac the official performance machines of the NCAA. ESPN. You don't have to tell This is the Pontiac Performance Halftime Report. Times Square in New York City. We often see the ball drop there to bring in a new year. Bringing in a new era with Rutgers as a player on the national scene in college football. Scarlet Knights down to Louisville in a battle of unbeatens, 25 to 14. They can watch the game right up there on the big screen in Times Square. That way, the naked cowboy can watch. Oh, you ever seen him? He sits there in his skivvies and plays his guitar. Wasn't at the top yeah. of my list. <laughs> <laughs> burning questions. First burning question. Other than, can somebody in Times Square bring Mayday a new watch? Should a Big <laughs> East team go undefeated playing the BCS championship game? Originally, I would say no, but now I say yes, and I want to tell you why. Oh. Because it's easier to say, okay, you come in, even though we don't think you're the second best team in the country, rather than us try to explain to California, to Texas, to Florida, to Auburn, why you aren't in the championship game. So the reason, bring Louisville. 
<laughs> now we've done five news hits, three sports that are hits, and you've been saying no Louisville, no Louisville. I'm going to tell you why Louisville. Because if you look at the schedule by season's end, nine out of their 12 opponents will most likely be playing in bowl games. They beat a tough Miami team early at home. They beat West Virginia last week. You've got a tremendous offense that nobody really shuts down. They find ways to score points offensively. Defensively, they need to improve. But on the offensive side of the ball, an undefeated Louisville team deserves to play in a national championship. I'm glad Lou's listening. It finally rubbed off. It was like, we did 3,500 shows today on this subject. Well, let me tell you, how do you explain to the other ones you are in the game? Each would say, Louisville, you're in. Yeah, that's what you think, because the next burning question is, which one lost team makes the best case to be in the title game? I, you know, you could say Texas, because had they not played Ohio State, they'd be undefeated. But I have to go with the University of California, and I want to tell you the reason why. Because I think California is playing awful well, and they're a balanced football team. You got Marshawn Lynch, yeah, you got Justin Forsett running the ball, you got Nate Longshore, you got Deshaun Jackson's receiver, you got a great defense. They're just very, very talented. And they have one more difficult game. I don't think it's difficult. Mark does against Southern Cal. I think they beat Southern Cal. <laughs> They win, they end up with one loss, either go to the Rose Bowl or the championship game. You said their offense was great. Their offense is spectacular, but you didn't say one word about defense. They're one of the worst teams in the Pac-10 on defense. The one loss team that deserves a shot, it's got to be Southern California. They have the best defense in the conference. They only give up 15 points a game, and you win championships on defense, defense, defense. Coach, you know that. And not only that, their offense can score with anybody. Steve Smith, Wayne. Jarrett, John David Booty at quarterback. This team is the most balanced team on offense, defense, special teams, and the entire Pac-10 <laughs> conference. And after they defeat Oregon on Saturday, Cal next week, and crush Notre Dame the following week, they've <laughs> got to be one of the top three teams in the nation. You sound like a comedian out of work. <laughs> I want to tell you right now, there is no way Southern Cal runs the table. <laughs> Conveniently ignoring all of the SEC teams, too, I noticed both of you are doing. Why shouldn't Jim Jim Trestle and Lloyd Carr be worried about a letdown this weekend? Oh, no, no. They're going to come back. They're going to play hard. All you say to them, gentlemen, there's two types of teams right now. Those that have a chance to do something like you, you have a chance to win the national championship. You're that close. And the other type of team is somebody that ruins somebody else's dreams. That's what Northwestern will try to do today. Don't let it happen. Go play. Butt them in the mouth. Knock them in the dirt. Win the first half. Eat hot dogs and Cokes third quarter. They should have you come in just for the pregame. <laughs> Not only that, I don't think they have anything to worry about. It's because I think last week both of those teams knew that they dodged one last week. It was a wake-up call for both of these teams. And I guarantee you, both these teams probably ran gasters this week after practice and some extra ones and did some extra one-on-one -on -one blocking, some pass protection drills, just so the coaches were a little salty this week to let them know that they can not stumble versus bad teams. That's why you will see the best out of both of these teams this weekend. A couple of the Michigan players saying they were squarely focused on Indiana because they nearly found out exactly what it's like to overlook a team with that comeback by Ball State last week. One more week to go. One more Saturday to survive before the showdown. You can see Ohio State and Michigan play in their final opponents before crashing against each other in Columbus next week on ABC and ESPN. Ohio State and Northwestern at Saturday at 3.30 on ABC. Michigan and Indiana at the same time on ESPN HD. It starts at 3.30 Eastern, 12.30 on the West Coast. When we continue on Pontiac Performance Halftime Report, we'll tell you why it's no go for Joe Paterno this week against Temple. Our game between Louisville and Rutgers. Ray Rice and the Scarlet Knights getting Rutgers back in it 25-14 at the half. The game. Judge Ito on defense overruled by Jawan Spillman who took the kickoff back 100 yards. Louisville up by 11 at the break. Touchdown! 
It's Jimmy O'Reilly with his first career touchdown. And now it's Rice. He's around the corner. Ray Rice headed to the end zone. Yes. Touchdown. <laughs> <laughs> Vivian Stringer, the Rutgers women's basketball coach, cheering here, here in the booth as <laughs> Rice got the touchdown, but it's Louisville with an 11-point lead as the Scarlet Knights face a halftime deficit for the first time this year, Kirk. They were down briefly to Ohio U, 7-zip, trailed South Florida by four, but a different deal against Louisville, and you would not have thought that a huge edge in special teams would be the big reason. Why. Yeah, but I, I think those experiences you just talked about, I think, give uh, the Scarlet Knights hope as they're in there at halftime, and I think that's really the message if I were Greg Schiano that I would talk to my team about, hey, number one, we're at home. We played well on the road. Early in this game, Brian Brom, in fact, the first drive, they went right down the field, 80 yards and a touchdown. Tell you, after that, the Scarlet Knights mixing up different looks, blitzing, and the Home Depot coaching adjustment on defense and continue to apply that pressure on Brian Brom, continue to try to put him in a position where he feels that pressure up front. And if you're on offense, it's all about trying to just not panic. Relax, continue to stick with your game plan. But Brian Brom has felt the heat from this Scarlet Knights defense. Six hurries, two sacks, an interception where his older brother and quarterback coach went ballistic. Uh, but at, uh, in Rutgers, this first possession for their defense is Brian Brom will get the ball. Will be very important to see what kind of second half we're going to see. That's not too bad. You saw the pressure stats for Shiano. I mean, Brom's a 63% passer. He's 8 for 17 in the first half, but had the two big passes. Aaron visited with Shiano coming out of the locker room. Yeah, guys, in a very calm Coach Shiano coming out of the locker room. He told me for their defense, pretty happy with what they're doing so far, particularly in the last couple of series. Wants to make it uncomfortable, though, for Brian Brom. Keep him on the sidelines. He said, we got to get Ray Rice involved more on the offense and look for them to throw to Brian Leonard here coming up in the second half, guys. Leonard has been quiet as a pass receiver. He comes into the game leading Rutgers in that category, but they've kept a close eye on the senior, and Rice will be active as long as Rutgers can stay within striking distance, and that means getting a stop here on defense to begin the third quarter. Remember the last time this defense of uh, Rutgers was out on the field towards the end of the first half. They came up with a big three and out when the ball was deep in Louisville territory. Then they ended up roughing the punter to give Brian Brom another chance, but still didn't give up any points. You know, Ito's been very good at reaching the end zone on touchbacks all year, not tonight. And once again, they'll have a kickoff return. Attempt this time, good coverage by the Scarlet Knights. Is there a kitchen there on the stop? But Rutgers special teams, solid throughout. Not tonight. Big hit here, though. Well, Kitchen got into the kitchen here. Of guy. <laughs> I mean, that was a big hit. Comes in high. Mm. It was a clothesline, but he did not get his hands up around the face mask. The guy goes a buck 60, so it doesn't take that much time. <laughs> <laughs> right. Cat on his feet, waving the towels again. Smith having a hard time hearing the play from Brown. But once he gets the football, knows what to do, breaks a tackle, a nice game for 15, a flag down on the far sidelines. Record on the stop. And that holding area, bring it back, but not be surprised at all here to see Bobby Petrino go back to the basics, trying to run right into the teeth of that defense of Rutgers with all that Number movement. 68 on the offense, 10 yard penalty for the spot of the foul, and three first down. You got George Bussey, the tackle, who's had a couple penalties tonight. They've had great success with that power run again. Yeah, that, that, that's one of the ways you try to attack a team that moves so much is just roll up your sleeves as the Sunshine Skill Line to to see, over here? and just yeah. seriously run right into that movement with your offensive line and a big power back. Well, the holding penalty was downfield, so it only creates a first and 11. Ron runs out of time and runs forward for a short game. We saw in the first half how many times Louisville went underneath. One of the adjustments that looks like Rutgers will make is as the receiver comes underneath, this time he has to negate because there's pressure underneath. That play right there to Riley worked to Harry Douglas and Riley quite a bit. Great adjustment there by Greg Schiano taking that away. Smith cuts back inside again, running through some arm tackles. 
Falls forward for a couple. George Johnson on the stop. Smith has proven to be a real physical runner out of Tallahassee. Enjoying the fact that he feels like he's made the right choice here in choosing Louisville as the hometown Seminole struggle. Third and four. Four receivers set. Brom over the middle, incomplete. I thought we might see a flag for interference. On Geralt, the safety was all over the receiver. And I think he's got his feet tangled up with the receiver. Again, it's the underneath route. Comes in there a little bit. Yeah, comes in early. Brian Brom say, whoa, wait a second. That was big time pass interference. The Rutgers gets away with it. Not only the feet getting tangled up, he came in and made contact with his body, but Louisville loves the underneath routes against the man coverage from Rutgers. But a big stop to force the punt. And she gets it away. Foster has some room. Oh, just tripped up there. A flag is down on the return. Foster had some daylight. Latarius Thomas just able to get him by the ankle, but... Bentley looks to be on the Scarlet Knights. Would have had great field position. Well, this, Once again, it, a special team's mistake. Hidden, hidden yardage. This is one of those plays where you're Greg Schiano, you just go During back. The return, illegal block in the back. Number 25 on the return team. 10-yard penalty from the spot of the foul. First down. Well, that was frustrating. That'll cost them about 17 yep. yards in yep. penalties. These are the two unbeaten teams left in the Big East. Again, you know, you play the seven conference games, so these teams not even halfway through. That's what they have to kind of keep reminding people. Other, other conferences winding down with their schedule. These guys just getting cranked up. It goes right through December 2nd. Still a lot of big games to be played, regardless of the outcome of this game tonight. See how Rutgers decides to attack here in the second half where they threw so much with Teal, especially on first and ten. Two tight ends to the left of the formation. And it's Rice running to that side. Just pure power of football, but not much. Just tried to outman him over there. Well, it's tough to outman yeah, nine guys there. up in the box. But we, we talked how Rutgers did a good job of stopping Brian Brom, even though they gave up 25 points. A lot of that had to do with Spillman on the big kickoff return. But holding Brom to 133 yards is pretty good. But look at the time of possession. Scarlet Knights cannot get their hands on the football, which is an important thing to do when you rely so much on running the ball. One of those fourth down conversions, a fake punt converted by Nate Harris, the linebacker on the short snap. Teal on second and long. Has to dodge pressure. Now dumps it off short. Got by Rice for a minimal gain there. Moby Akoye was there in a hurry. Got a hand on Teal. Had to fight away from him. Four-yard gain. What a surprise. It's Okoye for the Cardinals getting penetration and allowing Mike Cassidy, the defensive coordinator, what a luxury of having a dominant defensive lineman. The reason is you don't always have to blitz to get pressure on a quarterback. Did he have to fight out the hold there a little bit? Yeah, he fought, through, he fought through a couple arm tackles. Third and five for the Knights. Teal. Incomplete, almost intercepted on the slant. He was looking for Dennis Campbell. Gavin Smart there on the coverage. So Rutgers three and out on their first possession. Crucial one in the third quarter. Yeah, tough. It's it's what's happening is with the lack of experience from the receiving core for Rutgers. They have a young group, a group that has a great future, but right now they just it's so far in this game when they've come across the middle. They've shown their inexperience and being a little intimidated by this Louisville defense. And this is Sean Tucker, their senior captain, the receiver who remains out. With a broken ankle on the punt. Up the middle. Once again, it's Jawan Spillman who's been dangerous tonight out near the 45-yard line. So good field position for the Cardinals as they try to build on this 11-point lead. The commissioner of the Big East who deserves to up out his chest a little bit these days. Mike Trangizi will join us when we come back to Rutgers.
Talked about how long it's been since the Metropolitan New York area has hosted a meaningful big college football game late in the season. We talked about Army and Notre Dame 60 years ago. Empire State Building lit up with Rutgers Red tonight, but the home team down by 11 to Louisville. Early third quarter. Needed team successful in its first possession of the second half, and Brown pressured and sacked. Eric Foster got him. Rutgers, one of the best sack teams in the country coming in for the third time. Down 11, they're going to continue to gamble and continue to take chances. It's really paid dividends in the first half as they've come out here in this second series in the second half. They know that they've got to get the ball back to Mike Teal. 30 sacks coming in, one of the best in the country at pressuring quarterbacks. Not only three sacks, but numerous hurries. They have made Brian Brom uncomfortable tonight in the pocket. You know, Eric Foster had something to say in the locker room. He's one of the fiery, emotional guys in the Rutgers defense, and he backs it up with a big play there. Second and 16. It's Smith picking his way close to the sideline. Gets back near the initial line of scrimmage. These are proud times for the Big East Conference. Two weeks and two collisions of unbeatens. And the commissioner, Mike Trangizi, nice enough to join us here in the booth. Talked about what a big night it is for the New York area with a college football game of, of this magnitude. Big night for your conference, too. Not bad for a league that was proclaimed dead a few years ago. Huh? You, you can you can gloat a little bit. It's okay. I think dead is being kind. I think they had us in the coffin. It, it's just great to see uh, people work hard and to uh, rebuild. And our people are enjoying themselves. On third and 11. Rom fires over the middle, intended for Arudia, overthrown. And Rutgers defense does its job once again. Mike, you've resisted so far campaigning for Louisville, number three in the BCS. Have you seen what you were looking for in those standings and the voters giving this team respect? There's still plenty of skeptics out there. Well, it seems a lot of coaches are all of a sudden uh, they want to get involved in the selection process. I, I, I've talked to all three of our coaches before we played the West Virginia Louisville game in our ADs, and I just told them we're not going to get involved in it. Uh, there's a system or part of it in the system. You will not, place. no matter what happens. No, if, we're, if we have a 12 0 team that doesn't get in, we're not going to gripe because my answer to uh, my answer to the whole situation is if the system's wrong, then let's change it. You know, I mean, all six of the conferences were responsible for the system, and the coaches that are complaining about it now, it was their commissioners and their Indeed. conferences that were part of the decision-making process. If they want to have a playoff, they want to have a plus one, then let's go do it. But to sit here and, and you know, it doesn't bother me, but, but to see coaches being critical of other coaches' programs, I, I just don't, don't think it, it helps any of us in college football. We're seeing the depth of this conference this year, Mike, but through that transition of losing ball Boston College, Virginia Tech, and Miami, sitting in your chair. What was the toughest part of going through that process? I think waking up the next morning and <laughs> facing reality. And, and I, I, you know, we had five programs who really didn't know whether they were going to be able to continue to compete at football's highest level. Um, Two of those programs, Pitt and Syracuse, had won national championships. West Virginia had played for a national championship. Rutgers had played in the first football game ever played. And Connecticut had just uh, spent millions of dollars upgrading, and they were sitting there not knowing whether or not they would be able to compete. That, that was the hardest thing. What was your message during that process to get people to believe in the future? told them we had no choice. We had to work hard and push and, and everybody was going to have to contribute in terms of facilities and commitments and making certain we hired good coaches. You know, it just happened so fast though, Kirk. I mean, I, I don't know that any of us thought that three years later we'd be playing back-to-back -back undefeated <laughs> games on ESPN in prime time. It's Brian Leonard collecting the pass from Teal after the first down carry by Leonard. Short gain on the reception and set up a third down. It carries a lot of weight for Rutgers in their efforts to get back in here already midway in the third quarter. Mike, thanks very much for taking the time to join us. We appreciate that. And and uh, who knows if Louisville is undefeated and excluded, I, I'll, we'll be screaming for you. You won't have to. At least, at least yeah, well, <laughs> I think I think a lot of people feel that, uh, depending on what happens with the outcome of this game, that Louisville has done enough and.
proven enough that you know they're in uncharted waters for their yeah. school. I think a lot of people from some of the powerhouse conferences, the alleged powerhouse conferences, are having a tough time embracing what they're doing. And I think if you're objective, it's hard to argue with what they've done up to this point if they get through this game. Well, thanks for having me. Thank you. On third down, dropped again. And look for Clark Harris, the tight end, in his hands. And how many times have we seen potential first downs spoiled by drops on third down? Well, that's the fourth time, unofficially. I've been keeping track of receivers that have had a chance to make a big catch and move the chains and only to come away with a, another attempted punt by the Rutgers offense. Teal has played better than his numbers right now, 4 of 13. Just a lot of drops right now by the tight end and the receivers. And Harris is a good receiving tight end. He's a guy they count on. Couldn't collect that pass, and now they have to punt it away. And this time, a, a nice job corralling Spillman. No running room for the dangerous Louisville returner. But Rutgers defense has to go back out there and make another stop. Time slipping away in this third quarter. Coming up on Sports Center, what's next? Well, we're headed back out to the Scataway for post-game reaction and analysis. LeBron and the King. ESPN's College Football Prime Time. Brought to you by ESPN Game Plan. Maximum college football. To order, call your pay-per-view provider or log on to ESPN.com. Search Game Plan. And Under Armour Performance. The advantage is undeniable. This is a beautiful night here. Temperature's in the 60s. Very unusual for Jersey in mid November. Douglas has been on the receiving end of some of the big passes from Brian Brown. James Gandolfini is somewhere in here, Kirk, but he's pretty stealth. And he's he's kind of camera shy, didn't do a lot of media. Paul Robeson, the greatest Rutgers football player ever, a talented singer, actor, political activist in the teens here. Brown will throw it on first down in the flats, incomplete. It was off the hands of Stripling, really well defended over there. I can't say enough about how pressed I am with this Rutgers defense. I keep thinking that they're taking too many chances, and it's a matter of time until it backfires. But Greg Schiano has a philosophy. It works. And even though you're playing an explosive offense that can ignite at any moment, he continues to get pressure on Brian Brown. Louisville's now got one more yard than Rutgers has been giving up per game so far. We figured that would happen, but they've been doing a good job lately. Brom on second down, over the middle, complete. It's Arudia fighting towards the marker. Pops the ball, then it comes free. No fumble. It'll be Louisville football, and where they're spotting it, looks like Arudia is a little bit short of the first down at about the 43-yard line. That's just it. When you bring pressure, you're leaving your secondary one-on-one, -on -one and it really comes down to can you get to the pressure. It's a little rub route. He decided actually to go to Urudia, and that ball, that ball is, is well short. The spot's fine, but he, his man to cut to the outside broke free. They hurry up on third and short. Rutgers gets him. Rankart, the ex-walk-on. High school quarterback, wide receiver, safety linebacker, he's done it all here. <laughs> and a huge stop. I'm really, Louisville punt. again, Chris, really impressed at that time. They almost got caught off guard. Brian Brown trying to get to the line quickly. Ranker just slid right through, right through a gap and is able to get the penetration to come up with an explosion in the backfield. You force three consecutive three and outs against this Louisville offense, number two in scoring in the country. You've done a great job, but the Rutgers offense now has to step up and would hurt if the special teams would <laughs> first of all avoid a mistake. Making the fair catch is Willie Foster. Rutgers will have it at the 18. Rankard has done everything tonight. He blitzes. He gets a lot of penetration. Look how there's a lot of confusion. Guys are trying to get lined up right. There's two tight ends, so it's a balanced look from the offense, creating a little confusion. But it also, because they were confused, I think it confused Louisville's offensive line. But 47 Rankard sliding right through there and able to just blow up the play. See Brom not having one of his sharper nights in terms of completion percentage. Rare when he's under 50%, but he's had two big pass plays. Teal 
Fakes the pitch, has it across the middle, almost intercepted. He was looking for Kenny Britt, but Latarius Thomas read the play and had a diving chance at a pick. Well, he saw the play developing, took a chance. That's a true freshman. And Thomas, the safety, who's got a tremendous future and upside for the Louisville defense, taking on Britt, coming in. He read the eyes of the quarterback, Teal, and almost came in there to make the interception. You know, last week we got done doing Louisville, West Virginia. You know what the knock, of course, on Louisville was? Eh, their offense is caliber of a top three BCS team, but not their defense. How about the defense tonight? So far. It's been very strong. We go back to Rice on second and ten, and he just muscles straight ahead. Back to Latarius Thomas for a second. He's the first true freshman to start here at Louisville under Petrino. One of the guys to, comes from Florida. Both these schools recruit a lot in Florida. Basically getting guys that the Gators, the Knowles, and the Hurricanes are maybe not looking at in most cases. And that's good. You yeah. have a lot of good guys <laughs> down there. There's a lot of depth. It's a deep pool down there. And it's, you see a Latarius Thomas who's able to help this defense out. 6'2", about 210 pounds as a true freshman. He's a big time player. And see what they've got in an important third and six. Teal has time across the middle. It's high and it's complete. Ready for daylight is Britt. The freshman in a foot race. Loses the football. It's loose. Did he get it back? Rutgers ball inside the five. Not just an enormous conversion, but a huge play and a crucial fumble recovery as William Gay knocked it away. Britt got it back, 74 yards. I think it's interesting here to see that the, the, the young man who comes in for the true freshman is Russell, John Russell, number 13. His poor angle and the way he was breaking on the ball, and Britt is very lucky to get the ball back. His poor angle allowed the freshman to cut in front and eventually run all the way down the field. And how about the hustle there by William Gay and almost gets the ball back. Back to Louisville. First and goal. Rice, left side. Touchdown. I told you the motto chopping wood. That's what Rutgers does, and they've chopped the lead down to five now. One tree down. After that play. Down by five, they'll go for two. You said this wasn't an offense built in a quick strike comeback here, but now a couple of touchdowns. They look dead in that second quarter. Showed great patience to come back into this football game. Did not panic. Stuck to their guns.